Hey everyone, welcome to a special non-stream installment of my Cybernetics Cozy Corner. This evening we will be getting into some of Zeros and Ones by Sadie Plant. Uh, because of the unorthodox layout, there's no chapters or specific uh, paginated, paginated essays. Uh, I'm just kind of going to be going a bit lackadaisical in it because it's all wonderful. Uh, if you haven't already noticed, the colors on this particular video are going to be a bit off. Um, my webcam is a budget streaming cam, so it is not optimal for this sort of work, and I'm still trying to figure out a good audio-visual setup, because if you haven't noticed, all of my previous videos have that weird auto-focusing issue. So I figured out how to make that stop. But the cost of that is for whatever reason, it's impacting my color balance. I have no idea what's going on. So I currently probably look like, let me check my monitor. I look like a strawberry souffle. That's the color scheme of this video. <laughs> so that's why. Let's go ahead and, and uh, dig in. If you are following along, I'm going to be on page 73. Stick out a good one of the the wonderful things about living in a studio apartment. I kind of have to make up a setup every time I go in. Maybe how do I feel about here? This feels okay. All right. Zeros and ones by Sadie Plant. Flight. Ada Lovelace loved all forms of communication. Sometimes she wrote several letters each day, and much of her surviving writing lives on in this form. Think what delight she wrote in the letter when she learned that the electrical telegraph was coming to town in 1884. Wheatstone says that sometimes friends hold conversations from one terminus to the other, that one can send for anyone to speak to one. Wonderful agent and invention. Agreed, Miss Lovelace. At the age of 12, she had entertained hopes of writing a book of flyology illustrated with plates and told her mother she would be able to fly about with all of your letters and messages and shall be able to carry them with much more speed than the post or any other terrestrial contrivances and to make the thing quite complete, a part of the flying accoutrement shall be a letter bag, a small compass and map which the two last articles shall enable me to cut across the country by the most direct road without minding either mountains, hills, valleys, rivers, lakes, etc., etc., etc. My book of flyology shall contain a list of the advantages resulting from flying, and it shall also contain a complete explanation of the anatomy of a bird. Ada had plans to build her wings from paper or silk stiffened with wire, and also imagined a thing in the shape of a horse with a steam engine on the inside so contrived as to move an immense pair of wings fixed on the outside of the horse in such a manner as to carry it up into the open air while a person sits on its back. Next section, Virtual Aliens. They speak together of the threat they have const constituted towards authority. They tell how they were burned on pyres to prevent them from assembling in the future. Monique Wittig. Les Gluyers. My French is very rusty. I hope that's the pr correct pronunciation. The overwhelming majority of electronics assembly jobs are occupied by young female workers on relatively low wages. In this respect, there are clear parallels with the situation in textiles and clothing industries. Da, 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 da. Most of these women do assembly, the bonding of hair-thin wires to semiconductor chips and the associated packaging. Though the work requires good eyesight and dexterity, little training is required. And most of those segments are, um, quote, so pence this. I think I'm figuring out a bit of a visual lexicon to indicate when um, these theorists are quoting elsewhere. And also, side note, this is something that uh, Haraway touches on in her, mm, her essay, Cyborg Feminism, which I have another reading on in, on this channel. 
So you should really check that out. Silicon Valley, Silicon Glen, Bangalore, Jakarta, Seoul, and Taipei provide dispersed networks of what U.S. multinationals call virtual aliens to fabricate the wafers, assemble the circuits, set up the keyboards and the screens, make the chips that make the chips that turn the computers on. They work in the global factory of the new transnationals. On the West Coast, Filipinos, Thais, Samoans, Mexicans, and Vietnamese have made the electronics assembly line of microcosm of the global production process. Microprocessing has always been low status, poorly paid, and sometimes dangerous. The terms and conditions of life in the factories and offices may be the smallest of improvements on those of compulsory service in the home. Interesting. Uh, so because this is one of my more uh, relaxed ones, I'm not doing this as a proper stream, I feel a bit more latitude, I suppose, to go into my um, tangents, my brief tangents. But I will say what she raises there is a really interesting turn of reproductive labor, except what is being produced or rather, the way reproductive labor is defined here in terms of birth and domestic labor is the, the technological birth. To those who already have a room of their own, such moves seem paltry when compared to the rhetoric with which rights are declared and equality is sought. But these infiltrations won their spaces too. The work of these virtual aliens is the latest in the long and twisted line of microprocesses which emerge from the tangle of telephone lines, dials, operators, cables, tones, switches, and plugs. The keys, carriages, and cases of typewriters, the punched card programs of calculators, pianolas, and looms, flying shuttles, spinning wheels. If she hasn't had a hand in anything, her fingerprints are everywhere. Left and right, base and superstructure, proletariat and bourgeoisie. Like every reproductive system, industrial capitalism was itself supposed to function along clear-cut binary lines. Often to the great detriment of the working class, the antagonism between forces and modes of production has been played out as a personal argument between the men. A matter of political consciousness, a struggle between bosses and workers, firms and unions, states and revolutionary selves. Organized and organizing factions have confronted each other as two sides of the split identity, struggling to reconcile itself in some great climactic movement of revolution and theories, critiques, statistics have concentrated on male employment and the fate of the male worker who, together with modern capitalism and its critiques, has been largely engaged in matters of hand-eye coordination. Manual work and man's work have been more or less synonymous, both for the workers, hired hands required to do the work with their hands, hand tools, handles, and other hand-sized components, and the bosses, i.e. the ones who manage and manipulate the manufactories and assume it's all in their hands. This is the binary machine again. Two hands and two sides of a game which is supposed to be conducted by another single hand, the invisible hand of capital, perfectly integrated with the supervising eye of the state. I'm sorry, I, this wasn't intended to be uh, a tie-in reading with uh, capitalist realism, but I'm suddenly feeling a little bit of um, a niggle, I suppose, in, in my brain with the... Marxist super nanny in terms of paternalism and so on. Women, either their own or the proletariats, proletarians, as Engels called them. His best text, by the way, a compulsory reading for anyone on the left these days and woefully ignored, have been the least of the bourgeoisie's concerns. Immersed in the low-status microprocesses of textile production, secretarial work, and the production of miniature components, women are supposed to be the most inconspicuous and insignificant of cogs in the wheels of industry. Women have been off the productive map out of the dialectical, the dialectical loop. No desire, no agency, not even the alienation of the male worker. And 
she's speaking on a if you're following along and haven't dug into plant or her away or uh feminist encounters with technology before she's speaking on both a literal and a figurative basis here. There's the figurative absence of potential alienation because of, well, obviously the processes of work, but more in the literal realm, If a great example would be Foxconn. Uh, if we're looking at female production lines or textile production lines, for example, as well, women are holed up in these spaces of production as independent of men, co-workers on their same latitude, you know? Kept apart by the demands of homework, housework, and heterosexual monogamy, the women couldn't get together to organize themselves after the fashion of the men. But for all of the instabilities, and just gonna quickly mention the uh, triangle shirtwaist labor movement right here. There's a reason why some of the most um, effective labor movements in history when it comes to uh, workplace safety, so on, have been agitations led by women in these very cloistered states. But for all of the instabilities and crises it induced, the industrial proletariat was never the only carrier of revolutionary change, if it was ever such a thing at all. Perhaps its campaigns even served to distract bourgeois man from the really dangerous gorillas in his midst, those apparently inconspicuous, well-behaved little creatures who spent their time making lists, detailing procedures, typing, sorting, coding, folding, switching, transmitting, receiving, wrapping, packaging, licking the envelopes, fingers in the till. Women, children, and migrant workers have always been poorly paid, last in and first out. A reservoir of labor which can be brought on steam is required. They are brought into the factories, the mills, and the new bureauc bureaucracies only in response to the demands of booming or war economies and always under the strict supervision of their male superiors. Both the bosses and the male workers ensure that they are kept away from the important jobs. Managers treat them just like men, only worse. They are paid, but they are paid less. Their work is valued not as highly as that of their male counterparts. As for their co-workers, the line adopted by America's late 19th century tobacco unions has been repeated time and time again. We have combated from its incipiency the movement of the introduction of female labor in any capacity whatsoever, they declared. We cannot drive the females out of the trade, but we can restrict the daily quota of labor through factory laws. <clears throat> I think maybe I'll skip the next fun one. So that's a good baseline, I feel, to introducing yourself to Sadie Plant's thesis of zeros and ones. I'm not feeling Turing right now. The thing is, uh, Plant isn't just, her prose is incredible. So maybe I'll do Eve one. In the early 1800s, Charles Babbage's mother took him on to an exhibit of clockwork automata made by John Merlin, an engineer whose mechanical toys had made him famous by the end of the 18th century. Two uncovered female figures of silver took his eye. One of these walked out, or rather glided, along a space of about four feet, at which point she turned round and went back to her original place. She used an eyeglass occasionally and bowed frequently as if recognizing her acquaintances. The motions of her limbs were singularly graceful. The other was an admirable denouse, whose attitudinized in a most fascinating manner. Her eyes were full of imagination and irresistible. Many years later, when Babbage grew up, he brought this dancer, he bought this dancer and placed her in a glass case on a pedestal in the drawing room next to the difference engine. Since she was naked, it was necessary to supply her with robes suitable to her station. And in this respect, Babbage was helped by an unnamed female friend who generously assisted with her own peculiar skill and taste at the toilette of their rival siren. Yet beware ye fond youth's vein, the transports ye feel. Those smiles but deceive you, her heart's made of steel. 
for though pure as a vestal her price may be found, and who may have her price for five thousand pounds? From an eighteenth century advertisement, Simon Schaefer, Babbage's dancer. Walking, talking, clockwork dolls had fascinated the late eighteenth century obsessed with anything and everything mechanical. The most famous automata of their day were the musical lady and the chess-playing Turk, both of whom added the mysteries of race and sex to the seductions of clockwork motion. But it was the possibility of harnessing electricity which took dreams of living dolls to new heights. After Merlin came Thomas Edison. Known as the Wizard of Menlo Park, his late 19th century work with recording techniques and electrical engineering heralded the possibilities of automata far more sophisticated than any clockwork mechanisms could provide. Sorry, I just heard a strange sound. One bright spark took his chance away. Why not build a woman who should just be the thing we wanted her to be? Oh boy, we're hitting singularity here. Given that women are not only elusive but illusions, why not supply illusion for illusion? And to spare the women the trouble of being artificial. Written in 1884, these are the words of the fictional Edison, leading the light in a novel by Jean-Marie Mathias Philippe Auguste Ville de l'Aile de Adam. The future Eve, which is as verbose as its author's name, stars Edison using the latest chemical recording and electrical devices to match her Hadley. Virtual woman, an ethereal, electrical force without shape or form other than assigned to her by the wizardry of her maker. What you see here is an ariad of my making, molded for the first time by the amazing vital agent we call electricity. This gives my creation the blending, the softness, the illusions of life. An air, <laughs> an Andriad, an Andriad, an Andriad. Yes, said the professor. A human imitation, if you prefer that phrase. L'air de de l'air Adam le Eve Futur. Wow. Yes, my French is extremely rusty. <laughs> also, side note: one of my favorite all-time uh, novels that very much so is informative of why I'm interested in this particular territory of uh, artificial intelligence and constructed femininity is uh, Galatea 2.2 by Richard Powers. I'm strongly, strongly uh, plugging it right here. It doesn't completely focus on this, but it's it really is beautiful in parts about the constructed woman and the ethical concerns therein. The replicant of the future Eve was to serve as the basis for a more intelligent version of the pretty but flippant Alicia, the woman with whom Edison's young friend, Lord Ewald, was in love. The new entity would have the graces, but none of the airs of the original. She was an electro-human creature, complete with two golden phonographs said to be ideal for recording female speech, a simulated nervous system, muscles, skin, fluids, a flexible skeleton, and even a soul. Lord Wald, still incredulous, exclaimed, You, born of a woman, you can reproduce the identity of a woman. Certainly, and what is more, the reproduction will be more than identical than the woman herself. Because the idea of a woman is completely imagined. This is where um, I really do have to hold my back, myself back from making tangents. Hadley was one of the earliest electromechanical females to come off of the modern production line. In Fritz Lang's 1926 film Metropolis, Rothfang produces a robot to double for Maria. Fifty years later, the Stepford Wives concluded with a chilling scene in which the Stepford's last real woman is about to be killed by an artificial double intended to fulfill the Stepford husband's dream of compliant femininity. And this is why I don't use voice activated AI assistants. Oh, yeah, no, I'm going to do my tangent. So I have always personally had a long standing, very deep, uh, and completely hyper analyzed ethical, uh, I suppose, issue. <laughs> 
<laughs> with AI assistants like Siri and I, sp I think more recent ones, Cortana, things like that, because it doesn't, a woman doesn't need to be real to be real. A woman is a woman made. And when we have these assistants, when we uh, ascribe AI with gender, it, I haven't seen her, I know, I really should probably watch it at some point, but when we ascribe the artificial with these tendencies of assistance, of uh, service, uh, sex dolls are a great example of this, it is to reproduce a woman. And when we define a woman in a heteropatriarchal world, the woman is a, is a, it's not a being, it's a creature of subservience, you know? So I have always, always deeply cringed at the idea of using Siri in this way, or especially sex dolls, or, it, and it's been very surreal watching this, um, because something doesn't need to have a soul to have a soul which is, i know is a bit uh object oriented ontologist of me i know but i do feel it's a bit unforgivable to have a, a replicated woman a pseudo female the automaton in your pocket and then turn it into a joke it's very troubling and even if that immediate connection isn't quite so ethically tenuous. I feel it does reflect the way people treat and integrate themselves with these replicated women, these automatomic women, these amputated women, women, amputated women. It does reflect on one's greater purview of women, like living creatures, you know? Like... Would you ask a woman sitting next to you on the, on the train uh, where to go dump a body uh, at 3 a.m. as a joke? You know, you wouldn't do that. So why would you do that to the woman you've invented in your pocket? I find it very troubling. I'm extremely, extremely hypersensitive to that sort of thing. Um, much in the same way I'm <laughs> vociferously against the use of pinatas. <laughs> I'm very anti-pinata. Anyway, let's get back to plant. <laughs> of course, the makers of all of these machines were aware that they might break down or run wild away and out of control, and as the fictional Edison says, from now on, the snag to be avoided is the, is the facsimile physically surpassing the model. I'm gonna... Da, 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 da. Ooh, here we go. Errors. The 1984 film Blade Runner had already taken the ambiguity displayed by Julia and Barry to new and embodied extremes. Blade Runner's Tyrell Corporation performs Turing tests of its own, with a device which scans the iris of the eye in search of the flicker of emotional response that would prove the existence of humanity. Blade Runner's replicants have broken Asimov's law, returning from the off-world colonies on which they were supposed to be safely unaware of their own machinic status, and mingling with humans from which they are virtually indistinguishable. That just break the. I actually have a really difficult time watching Blade Runner because of that. It really just genuinely breaks my heart. It's like when you're. I suppose a great parallel to that is is gender when you've been raised with the expectations that you are something and you perform to those expectations to have the latent I suppose disruption of that is, is shattering. Siri has feelings, don't at me. <laughs> Like their human counterparts, the replicants are not supposed to know that they were made, not born. They are programmed to be ignorant of the extent to which they have been synthesized. Implanted memories, artificial dreams, and their fabricated senses of identity. But slave revolts are never driven by desires for equality with the old masters. The outlaw replicants have discovered that they are programmed to last only for a few years, 
And when they make their way to the Los Angeles headquarters of the corporation which constructed them, life extension is the first demand that they make. The replicants don't want to be human. To all intents and purposes, they've done this all of their lives. More to the point, they've done plenty more besides. If you could only see what I've seen with your eyes, says Roy to the optical engineer, like all of the replicant synthesizers, is barely or strangely human himself. Double vision, second sight, Roy's optical devices are not merely synthetic human eyes with one which want to extend their lifespan, but a mode of inhuman vision which wants to prolong itself. Deckard is the killing machine assigned to eliminate those replicants who have hacked their own controls and seen through the sham of their all-too-human lives. Rachel is a replicant who still believes in her own humanity. When Deckard sees her fail the touring test, he doesn't know what to do. Should he tell her she isn't as human as him? Also, by the way, I really love Plant's language here, because for anyone who's you know, really invested in cyberpunk and Blade Runner. We don't know Deckard. We don't know if Deckard isn't or is a replicant, which is one of the brilliant things about this film is the blurry boundaries between humanity and constructed humanity, what it is to have a soul. When Deckard sees her fail the touring test, he doesn't know what to do. Should he tell her she isn't as human as him, that she was born more or less yesterday and has only implanted memories of a childhood in the past? Will she be able to take the news that belief in one's humanity is simply not enough to guarantee its reality? More to the point, will Deckard, the real man, be able to take it? Deckard, the cop who's programmed to kill, controlled by his corporate employers no less than Tyrell's engineers and his other replicants. Deckard, who knows he has a past of his own, doesn't he? Only the most highly coded and perfectly integrated machines are unable to see the extent of their own programming. The Blade Runner's blind conviction in his own humanity proves only how efficient the programming can be. Even the attempt to simulate slaves has proved to be a high-risk strategy. It has always been said that the computing machines can only carry out the purposes that they are instructed to do. This is certainly true, writes Turing, in the sense that if they do something other than what they were instructed, they have just made some mistake. But one man's mistake might well be a most intelligent move for a machine. And how would their masters tell the difference between failures to carry out instructions and refusals to be bound by them? Perfection never guarantees success. On the contrary, the more it, it, schizophrenizes, <laughs> more it schizophrenizes, the better it works. And for wayward systems like the rebel replicants, identity is easy to simulate and merely one of many programs to be run. If um, I do have a lot of, I would say, ontological disagreements with uh, Baudrillard, but I highly, highly recommend, if you're interested in this idea of grief, of the machinate grief um, and instruction in AI, I strongly advise you to go through my cybernetics playlist. And I have a particular reading, I think it was from last year, of the woes of deep blue, um, I believe it's from System of Objects, but yes, uh, Baudrillard's essay about the very sad existence, the, the grief of deep blue, the chess machine. Let's see. I'm feeling one more in me. Give me a moment. Mm. Trying to avoid things that are very heavily uh, quote um, integrated just because I don't want to um, confuse, you know? Oh, Anna Freud would be an interesting one. Uh, ooh, here we go. Amazon. 
And this is going to be my last one of the evening. They say each warrior removed a breast so as to use her bow with ease, sacrificing it to Artemis, the goddess of the hunt, a.k.a. Diana, Isis, Let, Kybele, Phoebe in some canons. That's my name. That's me. I'm Phoebe. The Greeks called them the Amazons. Those with missing breasts, or Orpata, the manslayers, because as Herodotus reports, their marriage law lays it down that no girl shall wed until she has killed a man in battle. Until the 19th century, when remains were found across the territories of the sometime Soviet Union, the Amazons were just a myth. Like the vampires and the sirens, the furies and the fates, the female programmers of machines, more recent archaeological digs in the Ukraine have discovered female skeletons together with lances, arrows, and bows at the site of what is thought to be a Scythian royal tomb. This is the story Herodotus tells. The Greeks, after gaining the Battle of Thermodon, put to sea, taking with them on board three of their vessels, all of the Amazons whom they had made prisoners. And these and that these women upon the voyage rose against the crews and massacred them to a man. As, however, they were quite strange to ships and did not know how to use either rudder, sail, or oars, they were carried, and after the death of the men, were the winds and waves listed. Finally, they came to the country of the free Scythians. Here they went ashore and proceeded by land towards the inhabited... Oh, there we go. Oops. My computer was just about to go to sleep. Anyway, the country of the free Scythians, here they went ashore and proceeded by land towards the inhabited regions. The first herd of horses which they fell in with, they seized, and mounting upon their backs, fell to plundering the Scythian territory. The military art has no mystery in it beyond others, which women cannot attain to, wrote Mary Montagu at the... Montagu? Montagu? at the end of the 17th century. A woman is as capable as a man is making herself by means of a map acquainted with the good and the bad ways, the dangerous and the safe passes, or the proper situations for encampment. And what should hinder her from making herself mistress of all the stratagems of war, of charging, retreating, surprising, laying ambushes, counterfeiting marches, feigning fights, giving false texts, supporting real ones, etc. This is not the Western way of confrontation. Stratified, stratified strategies of muscular strength and testosterone energy, big guns and blunt and instruments, but Sun Tzu's art of war, tactical engagements, lightning speeds, and the ways of gorillas. Mm -mm -mm. Using such tactics to put an enemy out of action without killing him is the best way to sow disarray. There they are, Fates worse than death, a stateless woman people whose justice, religion, and loves are organized uniquely in a war mode. Artemis, later toned down and turned into a symbol of fleshy passivity, is remote and intimidating, offer, offering nothing for fantasy, a figure of swift and sudden action, a swarming hive which cannot be contained as one of anything. This le legendary tribe of Amazons is scattered everywhere. They fight for nothing and come like fate without reason, considering consideration or pretext. Spears and lances, arrows sprung from bows, the Amazon's weapons are slender, finer, and longer. Their arts and techniques of war were smooth, fast, and rhythmic, like the horses they rode. Less of a question of physical impact and the speed with which it comes, out of the blue, silently weaving through defenses and slipping past without warning, unforeseen, unseen, and camouflaged. Moving as flocks, advancing as packs, they operate with sheer force of numbers, not the long arm of the law. Tense and animated, they use anxiety as protection against trauma. The only state they're in is one of perpetual readiness, primed and prepared for anything. I never felt so awake, Louise tells Thelma as they slip through the nets of convention. Everything looks so different. The Scythians could not tell what to make of the attack upon them. The dress, the language, the nation itself, or like unknown whence the enemy had come even, was a marvel. 
Imagining, however, that they were all men of about the same age, they went out against them and fought a battle. Some of the bodies of the slain fell into their hands, whereby they discovered the truth. The Scythians determined to breed with the Amazons, and sent a detachment of their youngest men, as near as they could guess equal to the women in number, with orders to encamp in their neighborhood and do as they saw to them do. When the Amazons advanced against them, they were to retire and avoid a fight. When they halted, the young men were to approach and pitch their camp near the camp of the enemy. All this they did on account of their strong desire to obtain children from so notable a race. The two camps lived in tandem, neither having anything but their arms and horses, and the Scythians finally met with success in their efforts to befriend the women without dying at their hands. The two camps were then joined in one, the Scythians living with the Amazons as, as their wives. While the men were unable to learn the tongue of the women, the women soon caught up with the tongue of the men. This is why their descendants speak the language of Scythia, but have never talked it correctly, because the Amazons learnt it imperfectly at the first. Maybe I can do one... Ooh, yeah, let's do this one. This is a brief one. And then on page 143, I'm just going to do grapevines. There is always a point at which technologies geared towards regulation, containment, command, and control can turn out to be feeding into the collapse of everything they once supported. All individuated notions of organized selves and unified lives are thrown into question on a net whose connectivities do not merely extend between people as subjects with individual faces, names, and identities. The terminology of the computer-mediated communication implies an increasing sense of distance and alienating isolation, and the corporate hype enthuses about a new sense of interpersonal interaction. But the keystrokes of users on the net connect them to a vast distributed plane composed not merely of computers, users, and telephone lines, but all of the zeros and ones of machine code, the switches of electronic circuitry, fluctuating waves of neurochemical activity, hormonal energy, thoughts, and desires. In spite of, or perhaps even because of the impersonality of the screen, the digital zone facilitates unprecedented levels of spontaneous affection, intimacy, and informality. Exposing the extent to which older media, especially what continues to be called real life, come complete with a welter of inhibitions, barriers, and obstacles sidestepped by the packet-switching systems of the net. Face-to-face -face communication, the missionary position so beloved of Western man, is not at all the most direct of all possible ways to communicate. All new media, as Marshall McLuhan pointed out in the 1960s, have an extraordinary ability to rewire the people who are using them and the cultures in which they circulate. And this is, this is the heart of my work. The telephone, intended simply as a means of conversing at a distance and not designed to redesign talk itself, is an obvious case of a new means of communication which had an enormous effect on the possibilities of communication both on and off the ends of a line. You may also, if that, if Marshall McLuhan's work very interests you, I would also strongly suggest looking at uh, Friedrich Kittler um, and his. Uh, gramophone typewriter i believe it's gramophone typewriter it's been it's been a couple of years um what was supposed to be a simple device for the improvement of commercial interaction has become an intimate chat line for both women and the men who once despised such talk and as means of communication continue to converge the net tech takes these tendencies to new extremes it monitors and port its monitors and ports do not simply connect people who are left unchanged by their microprocesses. The roundabout, circuitous connections with which women have always been associated, and the informal networking at which they have excelled now become protocols for everyone. 
That feels like a really, I would love, um, if I ever have infinite time, I would love to do a full read of more zeros and ones. If you have any particular passages from uh, Plant's work that you'd like me to go ahead and read aloud, just drop them in the comments. But I, I'm going to reread that last sentence again because it just, it stirs something in me. The roundabout, circuitous connections with which women have always been associated and the informal networking in which they have excelled have now become protocols for everyone. <sighs> yeah. Honestly, in a way, that's kind of one of the bases for my work, I suppose you could call it, on this channel is... Um, I do feel it's a an intimate thing. It's a nurturing thing to read you bedtime stories from hundreds, if not thousands, of miles away. You know, uh, the informal, casual, distant boundary, still intimacy of it. Uh, it it nourishes something in me, and it makes me very happy that people connect with that. You know, that this type of uh, chat, this type of talk, this type of discourse can be had in a productive and just wholesome way, you know? But anyway, again, that was Zeros and Ones by Sadie Plant. Thank you for joining me this evening. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're safe. Uh, my New Year's was like three and a half or four months ago. I can't even remember anymore because of the Hebrew calendar. But happy new year, May 2021. I can't, I'm not going to jinx it. May 2021 be a different sort of interesting to 2020. Anyway, what's my sign off going to be this evening? Signing off from your cybernetic techno spiritualist Lovelace fanatic, non-automatonic, Doomer, GF. Good evening. <laughs>